Swiftful's blaring our podcast. Nothing is sweeter than Swiftcast. Hey guys, welcome to episode 61. This is Steph, Ashley, and Haley. And I don't know about you guys, but I'm getting really excited for The Giver. It's less than a month away. And a new still of Taylor was just released earlier this week where she's sitting at the piano. Seems like she's always at the piano. Which makes me really disappointed that they say she doesn't sing in the movie. Yeah, I wonder if she'll at least play the piano. I think they said they wanted someone that actually knew how to play the piano for authenticity. But it's such a small but crucial role. I don't think we'll see much of her. Yeah. Except, like, them talking about it. I really think she'll be in three minutes of the movie or something. Which is really sad, but it's going to be really exciting to watch the movie anyways. Yeah, I'm excited because I've read the book, I like the book, and there was actually a new featurette trailer released a couple days ago, and it does look like it's a good adaptation of the book. At first I thought it looked like it wasn't going to represent the book at all, but I don't know, I think they'll do a good job with it. Well, the thing is, even if she's only in three minutes of the movie, with such an all-star cast, even with a small role, they weren't going to put just anybody in that small role. Exactly. They had to get the perfect person who would like complement the rest of the cast. So I think it's still a really big achievement that she got cast. Yeah, and it was exactly what she was looking for. She wanted something small because her music comes first, which I'm happy about. Yeah, it's one of the perfect breakthrough roles for her. I mean, we did have her in the Lorax, but of course that's just audio voiceovers. Right, and look at how much she's grown since Valentine's Day. I think this is going to be, like you said, a breakthrough role for her and probably will lead to some other things. I personally would still love to see her do more voiceover. Yeah, I love the Lorax. She's such a good speaker that I feel like she could always do a really good job on an animated movie. Right, and I'm betting that doesn't take as much time. Probably just as much time as recording a song. It's just studio work. I would like to see her in a longer, more crucial role in an animation than just, you know, a few, a supporting role, I guess. I love the Lorax, but I was wishing she had more time. So now let's jump right into Keeping Up With Swift, which our first item is also related to The Giver. Brenton Thwaites was recently interviewed about working with Taylor for The Giver. It seems like everybody in the cast just has the nicest things to say about their experience working with her. And he said, I enjoyed her company on set. She came in with a great attitude. It's hard to come into a movie halfway through and be open to listening to ideas and sharing thoughts fearlessly. But I thought she did exactly that. She definitely adds a piece to the puzzle. I loved how he used the word fearlessly to describe her. (laughs) So appropriate. And kind of like we just talked about earlier, it seems like her role will add a piece to the puzzle. Even if it's small, it's a very critical role in the film. So I'm really excited for the movie. Yeah, definitely. Earlier this week, Taylor tweeted out an adorable cat meme of Olivia and Meredith. So it was Olivia and then behind Olivia was Meredith. (laughs) And her meme was... It's right behind me, isn't it? And it was really cute. It was so cute. And actually, I thought Meredith did look kind of intimidating in that photo. Well, I mean, she's like at least, what, double the size of Olivia? Yeah. (laughs) So I bet Olivia like hides in a corner from her right now. (laughs) Austin also shared a photo of Olivia riding shotgun in his car, and they were listening to Breakaway by Kelly Clarkson. It was really cute. You know, I feel like Meredith has gotten a lot kind of sassier. Uh, if you, if that's a word you can use for a cat as she's gotten older. I feel like she's going to always be the like more like standoffish cat and Olivia is going to be like the sweeter one. Yeah. I love Meredith's sass though. Yeah. I hope that we soon get a photo with all three of them because we haven't had that yet. I think she should just like start making little vlogs just of the cats. Yeah. Or a video of them together would be amazing. She needs to do a vlog of the cats. Yeah. That would just make everybody happy. And then maybe one day we'll finally get our Stuff Olivia and Stuff Meredith dolls available in her store. <laughs> Next album. I mean, if they can make Grumpy Cat plushes, I think they can make Olivia and Meredith. Can I just tell you guys that it's really crazy, but I bet it's true that like a lot of the Album 5 merchandise has already been produced and is like sitting in a warehouse. I know. Oh, I don't doubt it. And we don't know what it looks like. No, we don't know anything. I'd be excited to wear something other than red, though. Well, it's definitely getting to that time where every single time Taylor tweets, I'm like, could it be the announcement? Could it be the announcement? And it never is. 
Our next little bit of news is Taylor is nominated for three Teen Choice Awards. Uh, the first one is the Female Artist, Female Country Artist, and Choice Smile. So you can vote for those at theteenchoiceawards.com. And the show will air live on August 10th at 8 p.m. Eastern Time on Fox. So get to voting. It's already voting time. We don't have any confirmation yet, but I'm betting she won't be at the show because the premiere for The Giver is going to be on August 11th in New York City. But if I'm wrong about my gut instinct there, we'll let you know if she's going to show up. She doesn't make it a big thing to go to the Teen Choice Awards, sadly. I think that would make a lot of people happy, though. Yeah, it would be awesome to see her there, but I don't think she went last year either. Mm -mm. I think she was on tour. Yeah, we'll keep you updated in case we hear anything. But this past week, Taylor was out and about in New York City a lot. She was spotted going to the gym and hanging out with Carly Kloss. She was also with her publicist, Tree Payne, which... I was hoping means that they're just finalizing everything for Album 5 promotion. That's what I'm going with. I still love her name. Me too. It's a great name for a publicist. And actually, while those two were together, Taylor found this... It was like a painting on a wall somewhere. That It was wings. And Taylor stood right in front of it. And I, I think Tree probably took the picture. But it was just gorgeous. And she tweeted it out. And it just shows, you know, maybe Taylor does recognize that she's an actual angel. I don't know. <laughs> I, well, one, I love that photo. Just because being a photographer and finding those little nicks around is really cool. So I went to her Facebook page and there was a lot of people taking photos with that. And Vanessa Hudgens actually took a photo with that not too long ago. So it's really cool to see all these different celebrities finding works of art like that and really wanting to take pictures with it well and speaking of the artist's facebook page the artist's name is casey montague and she wrote a really nice message about taylor and shared the photo so she said speechless right now and so incredibly thankful thank you everyone for the support and to taylor swift for posting this picture and supporting my art i have no words i respected you before as an artist a woman a female entrepreneur, a musician, and an actress, but now I also see your heart. Thank you for giving me wings as well. I thought that was really nice. On another related note, MTV did a little article about it yesterday, and the headline of it says, Suspected Angel Taylor Swift Finds Her Wings in New York City. <laughs> That's an amazing title. Yeah. I wonder if any other celebrities are going to go take pictures with it, because obviously if Taylor does it, it's the cool thing to do. Yeah, I want to find it. It looks like it would be incredible to see in person. Just the details in the wings are amazing. Well, in other news from this past week, while Taylor was in New York City, fans noticed that she had some scratches on the lower part of her leg. And so people were, of course, talking to her on Instagram about this and trying to get her, her attention. And fortunately, she did respond to a fan and she told us that those scratches were not cat related at all. She called them fungeries because she got them while she was doing something fun. She didn't tell us what that was, but I don't know. Maybe it was when she was playing with a water gun last weekend in Rhode Island. When she was sliding down the hill on her slip and slide. That's the first thing that came to my mind. Or maybe when she was boating. I don't know. But she's actually back in Rhode Island for this weekend. So I hope she's relaxing and getting ready to give us some news, maybe. So next we're going to move on to our mini segments, and we have some really great submissions from you all for this week. Yes, and I love the first one. It comes from T Swift underscore updating. I'm always having Swifty problems. Doesn't matter what day or what time, it's always happening. Swifty problems. <laughs> Accurate. <laughs> our next one is from at book loving Jeff, and she said, regretting not knowing Taylor earlier and going to the Speak Now and Fearless tour. Swifty problems. I was having something similar to that. It was regretting not knowing how easy it was to meet her way back then and wishing I was was able to do that. Yeah, I mean, I regret not going to more Fearless shows. I regret not going before that when she was with Rascal Flatts. Just so many regrets, which I think is why now I go so overboard because I don't want to have any more regrets later. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'll always regret not going to the 
13 hour meet and greet and like Haley said not understanding how easy it was to meet her way back then and actually I could have gone to more sh- full shows instead of just seeing her as an opener. Well it's funny because since we now know that it was so easy to meet her back then anytime I go see a, so like a smaller artist I always like have to find out if there's a way to meet them and like won't leave until I like make sure I try every way to meet them because I always just assume that there has to be and I don't want to regret not meeting them years later. Yeah that's a good thing that you can learn from your <laughs> swift regrets <laughs> hashtag swifty regrets it's still it's a tough pill to swallow because you know even if you meet somebody else who's famous it's just at least for me it's just not taylor no it's so. never taylor <laughs> it's still cool though any any artist that you know you really like their music getting to thank them for that in person our next one is from at tori swift 13 and she wrote taking forever to pick which taylor shirt you want to wear because you have over 30 so it's a tough choice Swifty problems. So she has one for every day of the month. It's pretty good. I think I have, I could probably wear one a day and have a different one for about two months. Yeah, you're, you're pretty close to that. <laughs> it's not way, way over. <laughs> but I just keep getting more. Our next one comes from underscore don't swift with you. Missing Taylor squared. Aw. Yeah. Our next one is from at puppy lover 1202. Standing in line and the person in front of you insults Taylor Swift. Hold back in her scream. <laughs> Swifty problems. I've never had that happen to me. I feel like I have. And sometimes you just have to remember where you are and that it's not the time to get in an argument with somebody. Yeah, I've had it with people I know and then I'm fine with correcting them. But yeah, I've never had it where you're just randomly in a line or something. Our next one is from at Jody underscore AUS. You hear the name Taylor and your heart skips a beat and then you realize there are also other people who are named Taylor. Swifty problems. It's very true because Swifties always call her Taylor. Other people call her Taylor Swift. So when we hear Taylor, our mind automatically goes, puts in Swift without, you know, having it said out loud. That's so true. And our last one this week comes from Glam underscore Taylor 1989. Going to clean my bathroom while listening to Taylor. I can tell it's going to be spotless, Swifty problems. I always have that too. Anytime I have to clean, I have to put her on or I just won't clean. It's the only thing that kind of motivates me. It works. Next, we're going to go into our fashion segment and talk about Taylor's outfits for the week. Every single day is Taylor Swift Fashion Week in New York City, (laughs) as our friend Alex says. So on July 14th, Taylor wore a white They Skins Theory alpaca and silk cutout back top, which was $295, but is now marked down to $88.50. And with that, she wore a pair of white and blue striped shorts called the Black Orchid Cutoff Short in Skyfall Pinstripe. And those were $132, and now they're $79. And with that, she wore her Prada leather round toe pumps, which are no longer available, and carried her favorite Dolce & Gabbana large Gagta shoulder bag, which is unfortunately also no longer available, or maybe fortunately for our wallets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I really like this outfit. It was just so simple and so young, quote unquote. It was something like her generation would wear, so it was really cute. On July 16th, Taylor wore a diamond print shirt dress. It's made by Equipment, and it's called the Ian Archive Prism Print Tunic, and it's $258. She wore a Rag and Bone Newbury booties, which are $495, and then again, she carried her little black Dolce and Gabbana shoulder bag. On July 18th, Taylor wore a pink skirt and top combo that we actually saw her wear on Father's Day, and so this was called the Alice and Olivia Vance Boatneck Boxy raglan top and that was 176 dollars but it's now 106 dollars and she also wore it with the alice plus olivia blase flare skirt and those were both in pink the skirt is 220 dollars so i guess total you're going to be spending almost 330 dollars for that outfit but she paired it with her neutral color jimmy choo linda suede platform sandals those are 695 dollars which substantially increases the cost of the outfit if you want to wear it and of course she carried her todd sellotote which is 1500 dollars. they should just rename that the taylor swift tote 
She does love that one. <laughs> it looks really useful. Like, it looks like it can hold a lot of stuff. So I get why she uses it a lot. It's holding all the album five secrets. <laughs> <laughs> for other people who have a tight wallet and are busy saving for album five stuff, you could buy the bobby pins that she had in her hair. They were only fourteen ninety five, and they're from Anthropology. They're unfortunately sold out right now, but you can find styles that are really similar to that, and they're on sale. Finally, Taylor just released a new ad for her Keds Fall collection, and in the ad, she wore a burgundy and navy Forever 21 contrast cable knit cardigan, which is sold out, but it might come back in stock, or a lot of Forever 21 clothes end up on eBay, so I would suggest checking there. And you can also get the Keds Classic Navy Champions, which are $45, and Keds always has those on their website. I'm calling this right now. I think Keds is going to sponsor the next tour again. I think so, too. Given that they're staying together for the fall collection, I'm really happy about it. I love the Keds collaboration. This has to be one of the most successful like celebrity endorsement deals of all time, I would think. Yeah, I see people now everywhere wearing Keds. And I was like Taylor, I wore them when I was a kid, and then she continued to wear them, but I didn't. And now there's just this huge resurgence of Keds because of Taylor. Yeah, and I wonder, like, did a lot of people, like, not Taylor fans, but just regular people wear Keds before and I just didn't notice and I'm now noticing it because of Taylor? Or did she make them restart the whole trend of Keds again? And I kind of think she might have. I think so, too. They've been around for so long that they probably were starting to die off because people weren't really wanting them because of all the new shoes coming in or, like, uh, Converse were really popular. And Toms and things like that. Oh, yeah. So I think people are just kind of forgetting about Keds. Taylor can do the impossible, though. And now I see people with them on everywhere. It's awesome. Thank you to TaySwiftStyle.com for tracking down all the outfits. You can check out her website, and she has photos of the outfits and links. So be sure to visit that for more information. Next, we're going to move to our main discussion. And this week, we're going to talk about two articles that are really related to each other. The first one is called Celebrity Substance, Taylor Swift, and this is by Francis Bridges. You can find it on Forbes.com. Taylor's always, you know, she's in Forbes, Wall Street Journal. <laughs> she's just everywhere. She's going to be a CEO soon. I think so. Well, she already pretty much is of her own empire. Exactly. So if you haven't read this article yet, go find it on Forbes. It's really good. And Francis really just starts to talk about all of Taylor's accomplishments in the introduction of the article. What she's doing is going through to kind of dissect why Taylor is so successful. So in the intro, she just explains, Taylor sold over 22 million albums worldwide. She's one of the best-selling digital recording artists of all time. She's number three on the top 10 highest paid women in music for 2013. And, you know, everybody loves her. She can maintain these really high album sales, even though the industry is evolving and the economy has been tough. So then she goes into how Taylor makes that all work. So first, the author explains that Taylor is really successful because she's a storyteller. Of course, country music as a genre is kind of known for just being a lot of storytelling. And that's why a lot of people who say even though taylor might be more pop now she's even her poppy songs tell stories and that's appealing to everybody and taylor is as the author says a master storyteller no one sings about being a young woman better than taylor and so the author just explains that taylor writes not only about falling in love and complicated feelings that falling in love creates but she can write about other things like her family growing up her friends and she tells stories in relation to all of those subjects and makes it something that everyone can relate to. And of course, the author acknowledges that Taylor mostly writes about love. But the reason why Taylor is a genius at doing this is because she's able to write all of the confusion, hurt, and ultimate clarity into a song. And one of my favorite lines of this part was, I think her genius as a songwriter and a storyteller is underrated. And it is only recently that other artists are starting to acknowledge her genius. I mean, you gotta write what you know. For any young person growing up, your life is revolved basically around love and heartbreak. So that gets to her young artists really well because they're going through the same things that she is. And going along with her being a storyteller, I just want to say again how much I hope that she writes a book one day. 
I hope so too. Well, we know she did write that book when she was younger. I would love to just have her release it. I meant a more sophisticated book, but yes, that book too. Yeah, I mean, I actually don't even know what that book was about. I just know it's like 350 pages and she did it one summer when she was very young. And I'm sure even though she was very young, it's probably incredible. So then the author goes on to talk about how Taylor knows her audience. And she says, even though it's pretty easy to be a 24-year-old girl writing for the 24-year-old demographic, Taylor goes beyond that by having this sort of best friend, sister relationship with all of her fans. And they quoted Taylor, who has said when she was talking about her fan relationship, there's more of a friendship element to it than anything else. Maybe it's a big sister relationship or a, hey, we're the same age. And we were both 16 when my first album came out, and we've both grown up together. And yeah, I mean, I hear that over and over from all her fans, that they do feel that friendship with her. Yeah, and really, I think that is because Taylor stays true to herself. She just seems like a normal person, even though she's a global superstar. And that's why I get so irritated when people say Taylor only sings for 10-year-olds because she doesn't. Her music has evolved as she's grown up and matured, just like her fans have grown up with her. And 90% of that time, they're only listening to the songs put out on the radio. They're not listening to the other songs that don't get released on her albums. So she next goes into how, which this helps everything she pointed out before, is how she protects her image that there's never any tabloids of her stumbling out of a club, there's no nude pictures of her, she's never been to rehab or horror stories about working with her, or anything like that, that she prides herself on being a role model and not having anything that the tabloids want to talk about. So she has this really pristine image, as the author calls it, and she said it's a very brilliant marketing strategy, and she retains her initial fans and she gains new ones through all that. I love it. That's one of the reasons why I love her so much. It's one of the reasons why I bring my daughter up listening to her because she is a really good role model. Absolutely. And even though the author says her image is kind of a marketing strategy, I do get that. But I also feel like that's just it's who, who she is. is. Like, if you're not a nice person, it's going to come out. Like, you can't just decide to have a good reputation and just have one. You have to actually be a nice person. Exactly. I mean, I'm sure that she makes a point of, you know, like things that she does, like always saying thank you to radio people and just being really great to work with. I'm sure she knows that that, you know, has an impact on her sales, but that's not why she's like that. Exactly. And a fantastic example is she's gone to children's hospitals to visit with kids and she's told them she doesn't want this to be a thing she doesn't need any media releases about it but of course we find out anyways because well it's usually the, the kids themselves or the kids friends or families that post about it because they're so excited to see her and then we find out about it and we just love her even more so in relation to the section on taylor's image the author explains that taylor just does adulthood differently and the author makes comparisons to her peers like Katy Perry, Beyonce, and Lady Gaga. The author says that these three females have kind of taken on a sexualized feminist persona, but Taylor just doesn't really do that. She's not singing the same thing over and over again. And she and her music have just grown up together as her fans have also grown up. And she doesn't just change her sound just for the sake of innovating. With this, the author actually says, Taylor's songs have reached across the genre aisles, but they are still unmistakably Swiftian, which I love that word, Swiftian. <laughs> Usually I say Taylor-esque, but I like Swiftian. It has a nice ring to it. And so while other female entertainers are trying to enter a more mature market, they make kind of drastic changes to themselves. If you look at especially Miley Cyrus is a great example. They feel like they have to do something to show that they are now crossing over into womanhood. And Taylor just doesn't do that. She just changes the content of her music, and that's exactly what the author said, to reflect her maturity instead of making some huge drastic image change. That's what we've always said. She just stays true to herself, and we find out how she's been growing up through her music. I mean, most normal people grow up subtly, not drastically, not one day you're a child and the next day you're running around in like, you know, skimpy clothing. I mean, you know what I'm trying to say? Like you grow up gradually. It's not like overnight. You're just like an adult now. 
for other entertainers who don't understand that, what happens is the fans just can't relate to them anymore. But again, people talk about that as if it's a marketing ploy that Taylor is, you know, manipulating people with, but it's not. It's just her doing what feels right to her, which other people can relate with. And their final point of the article says, she's an oddball. (laughs) And it says, Swift has made a career out of writing songs about what it feels like to be an outsider. She insists on playing the unpopular girl, which I mean, I think now, you know, she makes less of a point of that as she did in her first couple albums but that's what we've come to sort of know her as so that message is still there and obviously she's been very successful for many years now so it would be and i'm sure she knows it would seem fake and weird if she still acted like she was an outsider because obviously she's not exactly but she still has that background so she knows what that feels like growing up and i think that has shaped her So after this first article was released by Forbes, another article decided to expand upon the message in Francis's article. So J.M. Bishop wrote an article called, Is Taylor Swift's Less Sexualized Image Helping Her Career? And you can find this article on powderroom.jezebel.com. And it's by J.M. Bishop, as I mentioned earlier. So what this article does is really expands upon the section that the Forbes article where they talked about Taylor's image. In this article, the author touched on a lot of really similar points that Francis did, but one interesting quote that we all really liked from this article was, While Taylor Swift is the lightest and airiest of stars, she also is powerful enough in her own right to be in control of her own maturation, even though the media consistently tries to characterize her as desperate or silly because of her dating history. Her desire to take control of her own image has likely helped retain her fans who might find more in common with her than with people like Miley Cyrus or even Katy Perry. Well, I think this author really puts into excellent words what we just described about our own feelings when we talked about the Forbes article. And she says, when artists feel the need to show they've been are now mature by making just a drastic move overnight. The author said that can be alienating to many women whose path to adulthood is not just about passive sexualization. I find it tiring that maturity and culture is characterized by becoming more sexual in a passive way. It's like we mentioned, you don't just change overnight. It's just a really gradual process. And that's what Taylor does. And then they ended with this quote and said, maybe the music industry will take notice that young women are often the best judges of what is an authentic trajectory of maturity. Because even if Swift's image is heavily controlled, there seems to be considerable evidence that she is doing much of the controlling. I think that's so true because no matter what you want to say about her image, she is the one deciding everything because of what feels right to her. None of what she's doing is a manufactured image that her people are telling her to do. Exactly. And that's why we love her so much because she stays true to herself and she doesn't change herself and alienate the fans. We hope you guys enjoyed hearing about these articles. If you have thoughts about any of the quotes in them, tweet us, email us, and we'd love to hear your thoughts and we can discuss it more on next week's episode. Yeah, and definitely check out those articles. You can find them on Forbes and on Jezebel.com. Just like Ashley said, you can contact us many ways. You can get us on Taylor Connect at SwiftCast13, on Twitter at swiftcast13 we have our gmail at the swiftcast13 at gmail.com our facebook is facebook.com slash the swiftcast and of course our website is swiftcast13.com and you can also subscribe to us on itunes and it will download you the latest episode so there's no thinking it's really nice do it okay well finally we have our next week taylor will what do you guys think they should finally admit that she's an actual an angel. <laughs> I think she's going to torture us with more tweets that we think will be about album five and they're not. Yeah. If you go with like previous years, it's always around late July where we get something. Late July, early August. So we're getting so close, but every day seems to make the wait more painful. I don't know what I'm going to do if she waits for another month or something to say anything. I don't think she can. That I think everybody is ready to explode. <laughs> Well, and the VMAs were announced earlier this week that they're going to happen on August 24th. Taylor's not up for anything because why would she be? She hasn't had any music. But I think, you know, kind of like with We Are Never Ever was... It would be a great 
place for her to perform. Exactly. And that's where she first performed We're Never Ever. So if we could get a new single before that, that would be great. <laughs> Thanks, Taylor. <laughs> well, and also with all the Giver <laughs> promotion that's going to be happening in like the second week of August, I think it would be a great tie-in to promote both at the same time. Yes, she's going to be very busy. So I'm guessing, I hate to say it, but I'm guessing she's going to take this week to hang out in Rhode Island for the rest of the weekend and then go back to New York, probably tie up some loose ends, and then maybe next week. I hope I'm wrong. I'm ready now. (laughs) Well, if she's going to do it as like a formal announcement that we are supposed to tune in for, I don't think we'll get any warning till like just a couple of days before it happens. Maybe a week, but she likes to surprise us. Well, we will definitely keep you updated with what happens. We know you're all on the edge of your seats just like we are. So stay tuned. Next week we'll be back with episode 62. But for now, this has been Steph. Ashley. And Haley. Thanks for joining us. See you next week. Bye. Bye. Peace out, Swift Scouts. Thank you for listening to this episode of SwiftCast. Visit us on the web at theswiftcast.com. The theme song for SwiftCast was written and performed by Sydney and Chuck. SwiftCast is not directly affiliated with Taylor Swift, Big Machine Label Group, or 13 Management.